Hello, this is Pamela Antical from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You are listening to The Candid Frame. You often hear people say that for them, photography is their passion. They love making photographs. But there are some for whom passion alone isn't enough to explain their drive and commitment to do the work that they do. That's especially the case when they are bearing witness to horror and violence. Patrick Brown's photography is not inspired by a singular drive. His work and his reasons for creating it are as nuanced and complex as he is. What's clear is the impact his photographs have, whether he's documenting the illegal trade of exotic animals or the flood of refugees fleeing genocide in Myanmar. He feels that his purpose in life is to be a witness and to hopefully serve as a catalyst for change. What I do for a living isn't a want. I, I need to clarify that. This is this, it's a need. I need to do this to make me you know, who I am. It's very important for me to be doing this type of work. Uh, yes, there is, there is selfish and there is um, you know, personal ambitions, but the, the underlying element to all this is, I think, it's a need for the world to see these types of things. And my, my vehicle to be best portray or best tell this story is for a visual me- mechanism of photography. Patrick's work often focuses on events in Asia, but the photographs have to be defined by more than just their geographic location. They are stories that, at their core, each have a moral center, one that was shaped in Patrick from a very young age. But one thing I highly dislike is a bully. And bullies come in all different forms, you know, just like everything else. And I think that's where the seed was planted for me when I was a young boy and there used to be a bully on our street who bullied all the kids. And I think that injustice that happened when I was a young boy playing street football or street cricket and he was always a nasty piece of work, this guy called Gary. I think that's where the seed was planted for me. We'll talk to Patrick about the many challenges faced when photographing an ongoing humanitarian crisis and why he often refuses to take no for an answer. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. All right. Well, hey, we finally got this worked out. I'll just keep my fingers crossed. But it's good to, it's good to talk to you again, man. Yeah, it is. It's very nice to, to have a chat and catch up and see how you're going. So you've been, a, you've been traveling a lot since I saw you. Yeah, um, I went back to New York after saw you saw you in DC. I did a couple of talks there, then came back to Thailand, and then I had I think four days, and I was straight into Bangladesh, and, and here I am. I'm still here at the moment. Is is that uh, typical for your for for your life to be in and out all the time? It has been for a number of years. Yeah, I'm a. It's you know get a get a week. I, I think the longest I've spent in a bed in. It's 15 days in one bed in the last 18 months, in the same bed, that is. Wow. It, that's, that must be demanding, because considering you know, the kind of work that you've been doing recently, that, that, that's demanding in and of itself, but living out of a suitcase just so compounds it. How do, you, how do you manage to take care of yourself? <laughs> um, try and get as much sleep as I can. And try and, you know, don't have too many hangovers. Um, and... Yeah, just try and keep focused, you know, try and keep it keep it simple and don't get complicated with life in that sense. Yeah. Well, as you're in Bangladesh right now doing some work that's tied with the work in your most recent book, No Place on Earth, about the uh, Rohingya crisis. Why don't we start there since you're, you're there right now? And if you could start with just, a, I guess, a, a, a basic primer of um, the circumstances that you've been photographing for the, for the last two years. Yeah, I've come back. This is the two-year mark, or it will, August um, the twenty, August the twenty-fifth. Will technically the the two-year mark. So I'm here to to revisit, to um, reconnect with people I met two years ago, see where their lives are, see if their lives have changed um, for the better. And luckily, I can report that it has. 
just to see where this arc, this trajectory of people's lives are going after such tragedy has gone into the into their recent life. And what I'm seeing is, yes, things have got better. They're now they have got some peace. They're able, for the first time, to have somewhat freedom of speech. They're able to get together in groups and talk and discuss. This is the Rohingya, of course, and work out things in their own pace, which they were never able to do in Bank- in Burma. They were never able to, to get together in groups. But I'm also seeing frustration now. They're, they're having concerns about education. They're, there's 900,000 people who are basically without work, without a future. Um, So this disenchanted, disconnected minority is slowly coming to the surface. So they've gone from one insecurity to another insecurity, which is, it's, uh, I think this long-term projection of where the Rohingya will be is still an untold story in that sense. Yeah, after seeing your presentation and getting the book, you know, I, I, I made it a point to read up more on it because it had been in, sort of in my, in my cursory sphere. So I kind of knew a little about it, but it, it, uh, I, I wanted to find out more after seeing your, 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 your presentation. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of it is that uh, the Rohingya have existed in, um, in Myanmar for, for, for generations. And they had initially uh, immigrated from another country. What, which was it? That was... Um, well, uh, the, the Bangladesh, or it wasn't Bangladesh in those days. It, was a, it, it had a different name. But yeah, they've, it, this has been going on for centuries. Yeah. The, the contemporary crisis regarding Bangladesh and the Rohingya, or Burma and the Rohingya, started in basically the early 70s. And it progressively has got more and more intense and over the years, and they've been pushed out of Burma, and then they've gone back into Bangladesh, and then they've gone back to Burma. And each time they've gone back, they've had more and more of their civil liberties eroded. So every time they were pushed out, they, the Burmese would take something off them, and then they would go back. And, and it's come down to the point where they now are stateless. Yeah. They, they don't belong to anybody. And that's, this is the situation we're in at the moment. Even though they have been there for generations and generations, the Burmese don't want to consider them as Burmese, part of which is, is because of the religion that they practice. Is that right? Yeah, that's, it's, it's true. It's, um, the Burmese don't even use the word Rohingya in any conversation regarding the the Rohingya they they call them Bengalis. So even the distinctive trying to you know show them as a minority, the standalone minority, is not happening within the dialogue within Burma. So that causes all sorts of headaches because they don't see themselves uh, the Rohingya don't see themselves as Bangladeshis. They definitely don't. They don't want to stay here. They don't want to live in uh, in Bangladesh. They they see. Burma is their homeland. They want to. They want to be taught Burmese. They don't want to be taught Bengali. So you can already see this clash, this head-on clash with them, with them and with the the Burmese. The religion does have a lot to do with it. Yeah. You were saying that this has been going on, in, at least in the in in its current manifestation during during the seventies. But what what was the catalyst for the? You know, for for the violence and the massacring and the basically the genocide of, of these people over the last two years, it was a build up. It, I mean, something like this doesn't this uh, this systematic approach to to ethnic cleansing doesn't just happen overnight. It's it's a very thought out, well executed plan. So it slowly kept building up. I'm probably not the best person to give you the, the total breakdown of the, the, the timeline of it. But you've gone from a, a nation that didn't have freedom of speech. Um, it was a very closed society. And this is talking about uh, Burma or Myanmar. Then democracy arrived. And suddenly people had freedom of speech. Now there's a, a situation in in Burma, which was called, it's got a nickname, the Saffron Revolution, where 
monks took to the streets of Rangoon and protested about the price of cooking oil, which cooking oil jumped up by a, a huge amount. And people couldn't afford to actually cook. Oil Cooking oil is a very integral part of Burmese um, food. And the government realized this animosity and anger that was in society was directed towards the military, and which is the government at the time, and still is to some degree. And they, from that moment onwards, they turned that um, animosity and anger around and focused it on a minority that nobody was really worried about within t- internally regarding Burma. So this minority then suddenly got all the energy, and that was the Muslims. Now, it's really complicated. The Muslims were brought, generally speaking, were brought to Burma by the British in the Second World War. And prior to that, to use them, they did all their trading, the British military did all their trading with the Muslims. And by doing so, to destabilize the middle class, the power structure within Burma. So if you were able to destabilize the middle class, i.e. starve them of money, you would then have power over the nation. So this dates right back to when the British colonial powers came to Burma. So mm-hmm. it's a very complex cocktail of things that spread over you know, hundreds of years. Fast forward to the internet, hate speech, anger. And it's, there's a lot of evidence that points towards Facebook that have, have got a lot to do with this hate speech and it started to ferment and start to grow. And over a period of um, a few years, we saw a lot of animosity towards the Rohingya. And slowly and slowly and slowly, they were sort of penned in. They, they had to demolish all the fences around their houses. Farming tools were confiscated. And um, then the, the militia, the gangs, the Buddhist gangs um, started to attack people. And that was, I think it was 18 months prior to August 2017. There was an attack on a Muslim section of a village. um, And that, you know, incited more hatred. And then moved forward another 18 months to to, um, August 2017. And then the huge attack took place, which was a military, totally systematic, um, organized as the Burmese military call it, cleansing operation. But I just want to say, this, is, this type of behavior has been going on for a long time in Burma with the minorities. What makes this different, and I'm, I'm talking the, West, the, Western, the Western situation with the Rakhine is similar to what's happening on the Eastern borders and the Northern borders with China and Thailand, with all the minorities. But what's different in this particular case is the pure scale of it and the organ, the systematic um, approach to this particular one. And that's where we are today. Yeah, I think the numbers are over 700 or 800,000 Rohingya who have had to f- uh, flee uh, Burma and, in, and are now in, in Bangladesh and other countries, is that? Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, the, but those numbers are slightly changed. We are now getting figures of 1.1 or 1.2 million that, uh, fle- that fled um, from August 2017. Wow. When you realized that this was a story that you, you wanted to tell, unlike other conflicts, you weren't, you know, the press wasn't allowed to come into Burma and to photograph this. So you were largely, and other photographers were photographing the sort of the, the outcome outside of that country's uh, borders. Tell us about the, the challenges you faced in terms of negotiating all, all of that. Because it was really just a lot of insanity and, and unpredictability going on. That was one of the most difficult parts of this this work, was we were the journalistic community and the, we were photographing or documenting the consequences of actions. So we never got to actually photograph the action, and i.e. in most civil unrest, there is usually one or two photographers or one or two cameramen or journalists are able to get into these war zones and, you know, give us some insight, some independent perspective on what was happening. But Rakhine State was totally locked down. 
So all the information we got was, was, and the evidence we got was obviously the physical injuries, the scarring that people had, and the testimonies. And that's why in the book I use children's drawings of what took place because we didn't have any, we didn't have any visuals of why these people were fleeing. What are they fleeing from? Um, it wasn't until later that mobile footage, mobile phone footage came out and mobile phone images came out. So the children's drawings to me are, are really important because they, yes, they are children's drawings and you take that with a pinch of salt in the sense of their view of what's actually happening. But these are, they're still people and they're still, these are locked into people's memories. So it was the, it was the, the collective memory of what had happened there. And this is done by, you know, eight-year-olds to up to 14-year-olds, the drawings in the book. And when you look at those images, they are, they are scary. They are, it looks like the worst horror movie. Ever. It looks like something Stephen King couldn't even think of. Hmm. And, and you were being uh, a first per- person to witness to people who lost their lives trying to, to escape, men, women, children. It must have been incredibly devastating to 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 be seeing that in the scale that you were seeing in and yet still having to use your camera to create evidence of of what was happening well that's my job that's my job yeah it, it's what I, I i set out to do and i set out to document what was taking place i wanted the world i i think i i needed the world to some degree to know about this this is not what I do for a living isn't a want. I, I need to clarify that. This is this it's a need. I need to do this to make me, you know, who I am. It's very important for me to be doing this type of work. Uh, yes, there is there is selfish and there is um, you know personal ambitions, but the the underlying element to all this is, I think, it's a need for the world to see these types of things. And my my vehicle to be best portray or best tell this story is for a visual me- mechanism of photography and the visual literacy that I'm able to bring to something like this is is where my skill set is yeah yeah in, in the past week here in the United States uh, there was some controversy about an image that was uh, published of a man and his child who drowned while they were trying to cross the uh, the Rio Grande River and some people thought that it's something that shouldn't be published. And the New York Times actually had it on their front page front page cover. And I was reading a, um, an essay by someone today who was saying that sometimes the, the morality of an issue uh, supersedes the, the taste that may have been so commonly accepted. They have a, had that a test for a test for the longest time, the breakfast test here in the United States. That uh, if it if it if it's a picture that would upset someone who was having breakfast while they were reading the newspaper, you wouldn't publish it. But I think that that image and some of the images that you made of children that who, who died represent images that not only need to be taken but should also be seen. But I know that you that you yourself at times had felt reluctance about shooting the images and, and putting putting them out there. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's um, I think let's let's break this down. The picture that you're mentioning is is not a bad picture. It's a picture of bad things. Let's just clarify that. Mm-hmm. It's not the photographer has done that. It's not the newspaper that has done that. They haven't set out to do this. This is the consequences of actions that are well beyond the photographer or the the media. And I do really believe that people should know about this. This is important. If this was an accident in somebody's house or safety on the road, we have a right to know as a public. We have a right to know. And these deaths are, they could have been avoided. That's the thing. These, these, are, not, these are not natural disasters, but they're a disaster in their own right. These are avoidable deaths. And if it annoys you, if it upsets you while they're having breakfast, write to your congressman. Take action. Don't shoot the messenger. And I always find that interesting where it's always the photographer's fault 
for showing you something that is evil or the it's stand up you have you we have something that is one of the most precious things and is becoming more and more precious as time goes on and that we have a democracy we have the capacity to vote we have a voice and if you don't like what is happening vote differently don't shoot the messenger it's always easy to shoot the messenger that's the that's the easy shot but to sit down and think about why this has happened the 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 history behind these incidents that's when it becomes it's not a sound bite it's you you need to one needs to know their 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 history they need to know the knowledge of that subject matter and and i think that the time that we live in at the moment democracy is something that is really it's it's on a i don't think the scales are really balanced at the moment yeah one of the things that I really appreciated uh, during your presentation was was the whole idea that of why you do what you do, and it wasn't really to you know save the world or anything like that, but to really uh, see your work as as a catalyst for people to take some action themselves. You know, whether it's to educate themselves more about it, or to write their congressman, or to protest, or to donate money to a cause that it's, that's in support of, of of the issue. And I think that that's was a, a a great way of describing the reason why you and many other photographers do this kind of work, because I think people too often think, oh, this there's nothing there's nothing that I can do. And I think your work challenges that mindset that there's nothing that they can do because they're not powerful politicians or, or, or whatever the case may the case may be. Did you come to that understanding of, of how you wanted your work to be seen and how, how you wanted it to impact people? Um, did, did, did that come? Was that did that exist from the very beginning, or did that come just as you? had a variety of different experiences where you were seeing what was happening in the world and witnessing with your camera and feeling like I need to have a way of understanding what and why I'm doing it. It's a multitude of things. And I think it comes back to, you know, my, my youth, my, I come from, you know, a Margaret factor in the, in the eighties and the nineties or the eighties, you know, I think let's, let's dial it back even further. I, I hate bullies. I really, mm. that's one thing. It's my, I do not like a bully. I like somebody to stand for something and I, in my, I may agree with them, I may disagree with them. But one thing I highly dislike is a bully. And bullies come in all different forms, you know, just like everything else. And I think that's where the seed was planted for me when I was a young boy and there used to be a bully on our street who bullied all the kids. And and I think that injustice that happened when I was a young boy playing street football or street cricket, and he was always a nasty piece of work, this guy called Gary. I think that's where the seed were planted for me. Mm. Fast forward, you know, and come through to where I am today. We're, I'm in a very lucky position. I'm able to go to, into situations such as this and be able to document and show the world, or hopefully to show the world, but I'm also have the I have the ability to you know I have a democracy I have running water I have electricity I'm in a very I'm in a very treasured position in life for for a lot of people and I would my mum once said to me once this is no dress rehearsal this is going live on all channels 24 hours a day and that sort of resonated with me when I was a young man and I think yeah when I I want to do my best. You know, this is what I want to do. This is this is how I I see the world, and I enjoy what I do. Even though it, it sounds it sounds a little bit morbid, I enjoy meeting people. Photography is an incredible vehicle. It's it's a visa. It's a passport for multiple worlds and realities that I can go in and out of. But at the the heart of that, there is still a grounding essence that. There is stuff, there is things that are happening in the planet that people need to know about. And my job is, or my, I see my role in this is to show people. I don't tell, I don't think I tell people what they should look at. I lay it out in front of them 
and let them make the decision and let them start the, the conversation. Let, let the bigger we talk about this as a, an, an entity. I, hopefully I'm, I'm a very small gear in, uh, you know, in, a, in a much bigger gearbox or the world that we live in. And hopefully I'll, I'll add something to that. I don't know if I will. Time will tell. But that's my take on it. Your initial forays in the photography involved some street photography, dance photography, but it was a newspaper article that you saw on a doctor working in Malawi that served as a, a, a big catalyst and a real pivotal moment in your career as, as a photographer. And, you know, where you ended up traveling to Africa, selling your car, selling your surfboard to photograph this doctor's work in, in, in this country. T- tell me about where you were at that point of your life and why you made such a, a huge leap in terms of where you were to, you know, traveling halfway around the world to make photographs. Well, yeah, it was, it was a very pivotal moment in my career. I come to personally realize that a, an image can actually make a difference. To what degree that we can always we can debate that backwards and forwards. But at, when I came back from Malawi, I realized that an image, images, can change people's lives. Let's dial back even further than that. I was working in a multi-story car park, and I was at the toll booth. The person that you people would give money to, give their ticket to, and I would take the change and you know press the button to lift up the boom gate leave and that was I was making ends meet and putting myself through night school and and uh, through art school with the money I'd earned from this uh, working in a multi-story car park and it was an awful job <laughs> but Sunday mornings is a dead time it doesn't really start going anywhere so I, I used to just walk around the, the car park with my camera or I would be studying photography books and things for me to take a big leap across as you described it to go to to Malawi, sell my car, surfboard, and my suit, and my black and white TV, and take 26 rolls of black and white and 28 rolls of color. I think wasn't such a big leap for me because my I've travelled all my life. I, uh, I grew up a little bit in the Middle East at the age of five, um, Oman. Um, I've grown up in uh, South Africa, a place called Frehet, and a little bit in Canada, in Edmonton, of all places. And my family finally settled in Australia when I was 13. I lived out of a suitcase until I was I didn't have a wardrobe. My first wardrobe I ever had was when I was 16. So for me, it's, it's not, it wasn't such a big leap psychologically. And now looking back, it maybe was. Uh, and not a psychological leap, but it was a, definitely a leap. And I'm going to take, take another phrase, but my mum, the night I was getting all my camera gear ready and, you know, getting all my piles of bits and pieces on the floor in the house. And I said to my mum, said, you know, the worst thing you can do is not go, is not leave. And I never really understood that at, at that time, and I just shook it off. But she was right. The worst thing I could have done is not actually leave and, and stay there and regretted not going, even if it didn't work out, even if I never got to see this doctor, I never, you know, I never met him, you know, all those sorts of things. And... She said, but what's the worst that's going to happen? You might have a bumpy landing. You might fall and twist your ankle, you know, in a, a metaphorical way. You're going to come home. It's not going to, it's not the end of the world. And I think that mentality has always stayed with me. It's just, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you stay put. Keep moving. Keep seeing the world. Keep meeting people. Keep evolving as an individual, I think. Through the end of this month, I am pursuing a nomination slot for the annual podcast awards in the categories of art and people's choice. You can help me to do that by going to podcastawards.com, register on their site, and place a vote for the candid frame in the arts and people's choice categories. At the end of the month, if I have enough votes, I'll be one of several podcasts that can be voted on to win in their respective categories. So go to podcastawards.com, register, and put in your vote. It would be very much appreciated. 
and I will be in Vancouver at the end of August conducting a two and a half day workshop with friend of the show, Olaf Stava. Spots are still available and you can find out more and register by visiting visualpoetexperience.com. Thanks. Help the Candid Frame to continue bringing you great conversations with some of the world's best photographers. You can do this by supporting our Patreon effort by committing as little as $5 or more a month. When you do this, you not only help us to meet the cost of production, but provide us the time and resources we need to bring you conversations you won't hear anywhere else. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Thank you. When you came back, and did you have a, a clear understanding of of what you wanted to do, and how did you sort of navigate it to the point that you ended up um, being able to do that and earn a living from it and get out of the car park? I didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't. Have, I just. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I went to Africa. I went to Malawi. Uh, to document a surgeon that had saved my life uh, a few years prior. I had 22 rolls of black and white and 26 or 28 rolls of color. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And when I returned, I still didn't know what I was doing. And it wasn't until my mentors, who I worked in a studio as a, you know, I did a, an internship in a studio, and I showed them my, my proof sheets and my slides. We had a slide night, and I projected the, some of the stuff. These are my mentors, and they were just saying, my, my Lord, Patrick, you really have something special here. And I just didn't think much about it. And they made me contact the local newspaper and said, you need to. They, they stood at me, stood over my shoulder as I dialed the number in the studio and said, you're calling this number. You're going to call the editorial desk and set up a meeting. And I did. And then... It was published, and I had an exhibition and, and, and won a, an award. And it was a real pivotal moment. And I realized that I, I had something to say. I had something to show the world. You no, know, my voice had some resonance. You know, my, how I see the world, my voice had some resonance with people. And that's when it, that was a pivotal moment. You, you just mentioned that the doctor had saved your life, and I don't think you mean that figuratively. What, what were the circumstances? No, I <laughs> No, I don't mean it. For this. I've, he's one of the nicest men I've, um, of course, he's one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. He saved my life. I had a very, very rare, very unique situation where I had a twisted, ruptured bowel and it burst inside my stomach and I was, I was killing myself with, I was poisoning myself. And he, the most lucid situation, I've ever had in my life is when Robert Whedon introduced himself. I'm laid on a bed in a hot, in emergency, laid on the bed, and he looked over me and he said, "Sorry, son, we don't know what's wrong. We're going to have to open you up. I need you to sign here." There was no like, "Oh, can I get a second opinion? Can I talk about this?" It was it was just the most lucid thing I've ever heard, and the most lucid decision I've ever made in the most bizarre circumstances. Um, my relationship with Robert Whedon obviously is quite unique. He's he's opened me up. He's he's had his hands inside my stomach and he's repaired it and put it all back together and and he sent me on my merry way. And I've only I only met him on his ward rounds after that, like four or five times, and then I saw him like two or three times after follow ups. And that was it. And that's when I read about Robert Whedon in Africa in the in the multi story car park. The surgeon saving people's lives, and he was the only surgeon for 2.5 million people in in Malawi. And I just spent, I need to know who this man is. He sounds like an intriguing individual. And it was more about my curiosity about Robert Whedon than anything to do with photography. Um, and photography was the vehicle, but it was my curiosity of who this man was that I wanted to find out. And that's when I went to Malawi and I documented what Robert Whedon was doing. And that's that pivotal moment. In, a, in more than one layer, he saved my life, but he also he made my life. Mm. How old were you? 
I was 23. 23, wow. So do, do you think that being that close, close to death was as much of a, have, have much of, as much of an impact as, you know, taking this trip and discovering yourself as a photographer? Nobody's ever asked me anything like that before, but um, I don't, I didn't know if I, I mean, at the time I didn't know I was that close to death. So it all happened in a, a very matter of fact way. It wasn't like a bullets whispering past my ears and I had time to think about it. Mm. But I think what Robert did do was, was actually show me how precious life is. And not by saving my life, but showing me what he was doing to save other people's lives. That, I think, is the more I would take from it than, than, the, other, than the latter. Yeah. It's what Robert, what Robert was doing to save other people's lives. The, the other significant body of, of work that you're probably best known for was Trading to Extinction, in which you worked for like, over either a decade or a little more than a decade on the trade of exotic and, and animals that are um, at risk of uh, disappearing from, from the planet. How, what led you to begin to photographing the, that and telling, telling that story? Um, there's, um, again, these things just don't, there's not one particular you know, door or jarring open situation. There are multiple of things that take place. I'd moved to... Thailand from Australia and I was becoming more and more fascinated with the forests and the jungles in Southeast Asia and um, on the Thai Burma border I was seeing these sporadic little markets in different towns selling animal bits and pieces and then 9-11 took place and obviously the world turned in a very different turned on its heels and went in a very different direction and the U.S. law enforcement were trying to figure out who the smugglers were in Southeast Asia. And they were going through the traditional mechanism of, you know, human smugglers. Um, they were trying to find the arms and the, the, who were doing all the moving around the arms in Southeast Asia. And the traditional contraband that they would use to do that, they couldn't break, couldn't break the neck work. But then they figured out a smuggler is a smuggler. They'll smuggle anything. It's just it's a car, it's a cargo to them. It's it's you know it's a paycheck. And the weak link in all of that was the animal trade. And then studies came out that um, how big it was. And it it started off when I started documenting in two thousand two. It was you know I think it was like thirty billion was an estimate uh, annually globally. And then when I started when I finished the project in two thousand and fourteen. You had Interpol saying that the possible um, revenue from animal trafficking globally was from 52 billion to up to 100 160 billion. So when those figures came out, I, I realized that nobody really knows how big the trade is. Now, the illegal animal trade is the third biggest illicit trade in the world, third or fourth. You have arms, oil, and Humans and animal trafficking are, you know, number three, and they fluctuate. Of course, influential businessmen, shall we call them in this discussion, are in on this trade. And it's low, low risk, great yield. Rhino horn is five times more valuable than gold. Yet if you're caught with a rhino horn, you maybe get six months. You were caught with that much cocaine, you're going to go down for a long time. Mm -hmm. So low risk, great yield. Any businessman's going to go for it. Stepping back, how did I get involved? I was working with well, one of my colleagues, um, Adam Oswald, and another guy, Ben Davis, who actually wrote the words for Trading to Extinction, were working on a project about the animal trade, and they invited me to be the photographer on the project. And at that stage, I had no idea what the animal trade to me was sporadic little markets along the border, as I mentioned earlier. And then all three of us learned more about it, realized that the trade was just huge and incredibly organized and systematic, and, and that led to trading to extinction. How do, you, how do you tell a story where so much money is involved, 
Um, so much <clears throat> illicitness is happening. People very protective to the point of violence of their of of, of their industry. Um, it's you know, like you said, it's analogous to the you know to the drug trade, and you know, very dangerous for for a journalist and especially a photographer to be out there documenting what what's happening. How did you how did you figure a, a way of being able to tell? tell this story because it has so many facets and pieces to it yeah well again i went in i went in naive and i went in with you know i didn't really know the full spectrum of it and none of us did at that stage but one of the challenges was from and i took this from my and it sounds like a strange analogy but bear with me i took this from my my photographing dance and ballet and it's, it's a strange analogy but bear with me when I was photographing these people in markets, the traders, and, and I would photograph them and I was getting nowhere. And I realized what the situation was, was it was my body language. It's a way I was holding myself. I knew that I was doing something that they didn't like me doing. So I was being secretive. I was trying to, you know, grab images. And, you know, something, what, 90% of all human contact is done through body language. Mm-hmm. And I realized I needed to disarm people, hence the ballet scenario, body language. So what did I do? I took the camera out, put it around my neck. I wore a loud T-shirt. I wore a, a hat, a short, and just looked like and dressed and, and acted like a totally dumb, lost Australian tourist. <laughs> and it totally disarmed them. I showed them everything that I was in my body language. So I disarmed them by, you know, by putting, pulling my camera out of the, was sending messages to them that I knew what I was doing was something that they didn't want me to do. Mm-hmm. But because I was dressed and the way I was acting, I had no idea what I was looking at. So I was, I was, I was a dumb lost tourist and I was fun to them. And I played with the, I played with their egos. And it would be situations where a guy was in one shop and I was taking pictures and this guy spoke a little bit of broken English. And a guy turned up on a motorbike, scooter, with two bear paws in the front basket of the motorbike. And, and I said, oh, that's pretty, that's pretty weird. In Australia, we just got kangaroos and, and uh, you know, wombats and koala bears. And he said, oh, if you think that's really strange, you should come in the back and sh- I'll show you what we've got there. And that's how I got into the back of these places and these shops and developed this re- really unique way, I wouldn't say unique, but this interesting way of navigating a very complex barrier by disarming, disarming myself and or by arming myself by disarming them, if that makes sense. And it just grew from there. That's how it went. I saw um, one of the videos that, that they did of you in which you're in one of those markets where they're selling animals and parts of animals and you're taking a picture and this guy tries to put his hand in front of your lens and you just move his land, hand gently aside and you keep taking the pictures and every time you try to do it, you just like move his hand and you keep taking your picture. Yeah, I, I, that's where the Yorkshire, Yorkshireman and the Irishman come out. <laughs> and, uh, and my wife calls me, she calls me a dog with a bone. I just don't give up. And I think that's... I think that's got a lot to do with my career is I'm a stubborn and just keep plowing ahead and keep pushing ahead. And yeah, I just, if somebody puts their hand in front of my camera, I just push it away. I don't violently get angry. I just push it away and carry on and, you know, do my thing. And if I have to turn my back and walk away from it, well, uh, let it be, you know. It, it's, it's, a lot of it for me is the storytelling. Yeah. And using, you know, my visual heritage and knowledge to articulate it and I, I find that incredibly challenging especially with the the illegal animal trade because there's so many facets to it but how do you tell a story with so many facets and so many angles and it, it was from you know some of the great photographers of our of, of recent years that I learned from and it's always about chipping away at this big block of marble, so to speak, and slowly chipping away until you get one image. And then you, you've got that one image, and then you build on the next one, and you build on the next one. And I look at it, I look at storytelling much, much of the same way as music. 
and especially photography for me, is how do I want the story to begin? Do I want it to be loud? I want it, do, do I want my intro to be loud? Or do I want it to be subtle? Where are the emotional highs and lows within the story? And I think that comes from a lot of, you know, living with a bunch of musicians when I was going through art school and I had their dark, my dark room was adjacent to their jam room. And the, each, each camera or each lens has a diff, is a different instrument. And I look at it in that sense. So the storytelling is, is the craft that I really love, the visual storytelling. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful, it's, it's a beautiful craft that I don't think gets, in some, in some cases, doesn't get the repos- it doesn't get the acknowledgement it should do. One, one of the interesting things about looking at your work is some of the, some of the images are very hard to look at because of the, the subject matter. But in, in some, of the, some of those very same images, there's an aesthetic beauty to them. And I sometimes wonder about is the fact that they, that they are beautiful images of the ugliest of circumstances do you ever second guess yourself uh, in terms of the creation of those kinds of images, even though they may be telling part of the, the story? Because sometimes the, the, the aesthetics of the image m- might get in the way of the story. Does that make sense? Yeah, and of course they do. I mean, there's been that argument with Sagado's work. Is, is sometimes his work is too beautiful of, you know, uh, ginormous refugee camps in in Sudan, and I mean, um, but I don't I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to that. If you can, uh, if you were to take the, and I'm no way comparing myself to the great writers of the world, but if you take a great writer, they very rarely can criticise for their vocabulary of of describing a scene. So, to 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 articulate a a very harsh reality in a very intelligible, in intellectual and intelligible way, intangible way, that's what I'm looking for, in an, in, an intangible way to articulate that particular scene to an audience that doesn't know and then they're able to digest that. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal to deliver something of, of a craft? The craft of photography, the dark room, I love the dark room, but the craft of making a, a two-dimensional object come to life in a three-dimensional world, from a three-dimensional world, that is one of the most beautiful things that ever happens in a darkroom tray for me. I find that just the magic of that arising. But I would be, to be criticized for producing a, a piece of work that is, is seen as palatable and, and digestible, I think that's the biggest compliment out. Mm. I mean, the image of the children that of the the children that passed uh, that drowned in in Cox's in uh, Cox's Bizarre Peninsula. I tried to tell that in the most articulate way, without being offensive or dis- offensive to the audience or disrespectful to the people that had died. And I I think I maybe achieved that, but that's not for me to judge. And that's my goal, you know, to to articulate this so people will listen and we'll read or we'll sit down and stop and, and digest it. You live, you live in Southeast Asia and a lot of your stories focus on the various countries and cultures and things that are happening there. And it really, really was interesting to see the diversity of subject matter that you have there. How much of that is assigned a versus um, stuff that you initiate on your own? You mean assignment work compared to my own project? Yeah, because I see a lot of the uh, the, the the stories in, on your website. Mm. You have an extensive uh, series of photo stories, documentary work there, and I'm wondering how much of that is is self initiated as com- as compared to beginning with an assignment that are given by a, a magazine or some sort of publication. Oh, probably ninety percent is self generated. I got in for, I got into photography for myself. I didn't get into to work for anybody. It has it definitely has its pluses being a paid photographer, but all the a large percentage which is uh, has its own problems and its own hurdles. But a large percentage of the the funds that I make from my photography goes back into my personal work. Um, 
I see assignment work as uh, as a vehicle to financially fuel mm, the other work that is also important to me. So it's something that I put back into my work. It, it, this is it's not only my profession; it's also my hobby, yeah. <laughs> which has a double-edged sword. Um, and it's also my you know it's where I feel most comfortable. So I think you to be an author to is and not to be a reporter to me is much more important to do a project that that means a lot to me it might not necessarily mean much to a to an editor uh, at the time but it's kind of interesting when you 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 show them something that they're totally unaware of and you see their light their eyes light up that recently happened at Nat Geo when I showed them a project I'm working on and they were just totally unaware of this and it, it's kind of nice to show these people with who are the top of our tier, so to speak, within our industry, and you show them a body of work that they're totally unaware of, or the subject matter. That has got twofold. Yes, it's my, there's one side of my ego has been, has been pampered, but the other side is I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that is unique. I'm doing something that's interesting. It's engaging, and it, it, it pulls people in to the point where we're having a conversation right now. One's in Bangladesh, and one's One's on the east coast of America. That's a really valuable tool. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible tool, and and that's what I love. In your youth, you moved a lot in different different countries before you finally settled in Australia, and now you're oftentimes living, you know, in a in a suitcase because you're traveling, doing all this all this work. Are, are you a, a person that has co constantly need to be moving? Do you do you feel unsettled if you're in any one place for for too long? See, that's where this is where it gets a little bit complicated for me. <laughs> I don't see this as moving. I'm a very, I think I am a quite a simple guy. I mean, my home, my home life is, it's, I love my music. Music is really important to me. That's my go-to anchor and keel. My wife is, you know, she's, she travels. So I'm very grounded in the, the mechanics of my personal life. So to me, it doesn't matter where I am in a suitcase or a hotel room, I'm still the same guy. Yes, I'm, I'm traveling a lot. But, you know, my home life is, is my base. It's where I go, you know, recharge. When I go on holiday, it's, it's sitting on the couch watching Netflix, you know. <laughs> I, I think I'm the same guy when I'm traveling as I'm the same guy at home. I don't think I change. I think that's, that's how I cope with it. That's a, that's a good place to be. My last mm. question that I asked. My wife might differ from <laughs> well, yeah, our wives always have different opinions about us. Um, my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Oof. Oh, man, there's so many talented people in the world. Can I give you my f top five, or do I have to give you one? Uh, one would be fair. I'll, I'll I'll give you three, not five. How's that? It's a good compromise. <laughs> oh, some of my dearest friends are some of the most influential people in my life. But one of the most, and he has become uh, a friend um, of recent years. I met him over the World Press this year. He's, uh, we hung out at the, we, for some no reason, we gravitated to the same corner of the bar every night and we got <laughs> chatting. A very interesting man. Philip Montgomery, an American, really. His work, it, when I first saw it, it was it's a homage to some of the greatest names in contemporary photography and of yesteryears. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. His body of work on America that he's working on, it blew me away. Mm. Just, I was stunned. Mm. I was, it was um, an incredible... I don't want to use... Two waxable, uh, wax, wax really lyrical words on his work. I don't, I don't type. I don't go for that type of language and talking about photography. But the the breadth and depth of his is his vocabulary is is, is impressive. Mm. And I would recommend the audience to take out Phil Montgomery's work. Check it out. Well, yeah. You wanted to give me the other two, or are you are you fine with just Philip? Oh, okay. Oh no. Um, there's Adam Ferguson. An Australian guy, um, one of a good a good friend, but his work is is 
he's got a really kind of interesting dynamic uh, repertoire. And Bill Burke. I like oh, a bit yeah. of Bill Burke. Well, the first two I'm not familiar with, but I look forward to discovering them, in, but I do definitely do Bill Burke. Yeah, I like a bit of Bill Burke. He's, he was a big part of my life when, uh, when I started out. Yeah, his type of work is, you know, it's got a nice ragged edge to it that I like. Mm-hmm. Well, sir, thank you so much, Patrick. I really enjoyed uh, being able to chat you up again. Yeah, mate, it's been a pleasure. I'm about to get my kit and head off to the refugee camps, and um, I'm doing a, a story on cholera now. There's a, not a cholera outbreak, but I'm going to mm. start working on a story to chol- about cholera today. So back um, back at the coal face and, and carry on from there. But, man, I can't can't thank you enough. I'm great to meet you in D.C. just recently. Yeah, and I hope we cr- get the chance to cross paths again sometime, sometime s- soon and uh, have a proper beer together. Oh, okay. The, uh, we have a saying where I come from, and that is I'm a bad penny. What's that mean? You can't get rid of a bad penny, right? Everybody <laughs> wants to give you a back. <laughs> I'll take that. All right, mate. You oh. take good care. And, All right, man. Uh, thanks for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks to Patrick for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting patrickbrownphoto.com. To hear and see me talk more about my own photographic process, visit the TCF YouTube channel, where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr poll. Check out the TCF Flickr poll and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My most recent book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. Purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code PORELLO40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. If you enjoy the show, help to spread the word by writing a review wherever you find and listen to podcasts. And if you write a review on a blog post, let me know and send me a link because I would really like to thank you on air. Thanks to Nan Tosi Lenz from Australia for their recent five-star review. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Joe Tillman for his contribution. It's much appreciated. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download the Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. And if you scroll down on the app, you'll find a free excerpt of my book that you can now download. And we also have an Alexa app, so if you have one of those smart devices, download the skill and listen to the show that way. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.